welcome. Today, um, I'm going to give you an introduction to Quarkus. My name is uh, Dimitris Andriadis. I'm engineering director at Red Hat and I'm, I'm running the, the Quarkus team. Um, you can also put comments or questions in the chat. I will try to monitor them as I go. And uh, you know, if I see something relevant, I'll try to answer it right there. Um, if not, we have some 10 minutes at the end for answering questions. <clears throat> so uh, Quarkus is a native Java stack for writing what we call cloud native apps. So think about stuff that runs on Kubernetes environments, so naturally microservices. Um, and also Quarkus makes things, makes Java relevant also for serverless environments. That doesn't mean you can not use Quarkus to write, you know, more monolithic style, style apps, but this is not its strong point. But lately, because of the, you know, features of Quarkus, we see things like uh, People who are using Quarkus to write Kubernetes operators that are traditionally written in Go language, um, IoT applications, or things that are related to edge computing. So uh, I'm broadcasting from uh, Neuchâtel in Switzerland now. To, now it's night, so obviously. Uh, and this is uh, on the left. You can see part of the old JBoss headquarters. I I came to Red Hat through, through JBoss. You remember the application server long time ago in 2006. And in that very office about 20 months ago, we announced the, the Quarkus project to, to the world. And this is part of the, of the Quarkus team. Uh, I should say that before Quarkus, I was running the JBoss Wildfly EP project for something like 15 years. Now, the, the problem we had put to the team was uh, what is the best way to write uh, cloud native applications in Java? And that question was very relevant if you start looking at how uh, the technology has evolved. Um, we know pretty much how to write monoliths, writing or, or living on application servers and providing the full runtime. Um, and slowly as you move into the cloud, microservices became the, let's say the dominant deployment mode. And then you look further out into functions and serverless, and you realize that um, size matters, but size in the sense that, you know, you want density matters. So you, in the same space, you want to deploy more containers. And also you want those containers to be more elastic so things can start up and shut down faster. And in this environment, Java comes with a handicap uh, and it's due to two reasons basically. So every JVM deployment carries the, the, the weight of the JVM itself, which was written at a time where the JVM assumed that it will have lots of resources, memory, you know, space to run and do its optimizations. Um, and it's great. So Hotspot, Hotspot is a great technology, but you pay that price every time you deploy an application. So part of the difficulty of Java to adapt in this uh, new um, era where you know, people may also choose Node.js or Go to write new applications is the VM, but it's also because of the frameworks themselves and the size they occupy. In Red Hat, we have been looking for solutions for a long time and in, in different directions. So we've worked in the standards. So Red Hat was pioneer in the Eclipse microprofile a family of uh, standards that uh, targeted the modernization of Java EE for the cloud. Um, we did an awful lot of work in the application server itself in Wildfly uh, to 
modularize it, uh, minimize it, uh, and make it very flexible. We could, we could deploy Wildfly on a Raspberry Pi, on containers very efficiently. So lots of work there as well. Um, on the JVM side, Red Hat has had some history in ahead of time research, ahead of time compilation research. That was like more than 10 years ago, a project called GCJ, Open Compiler for Java. And of course, innovations in the Open JDK project itself, whether they came from Oracle or from the wider community. But the truth is none of those on its own was enough to make things really, uh, you know, make, like make a huge difference for Java. And the main issue is that the frameworks suffer from the same fundamental problems. Um, they load too many classes. You, you, know, you write your application, you include a couple of dependencies and those, these bring more dependencies and soon you end up with thousands of classes. Uh, so many classes to load, which is an expensive operation. And those classes, they use, of course, the dynamic nature of Java to configure them, themselves on the fly when you deploy the application. So there's a lot of processing going on to set up the application at the runtime, many classes loaded. And if we go and see, you know, the typical application, let's say like lifecycle, you build the application, you package it, and then you go to run it. And every participating framework of some complexity will more or less do the same thing. They will try to load the configuration in any form. So configuration file, property files, YAML, XML, whatever. Um, and they will need the parsers associated with this particular format. So they will read that. Then they will probably do some sort of class path scanning and lots of processing there to find out annotations and figure out about what is that you want to do with, with this framework. And all that in order to build some sort of meta model in memory that represents your, you know, your desire to do something with, the, with this particular framework and your code. And once they have this understanding, then they will go, they create the objects, you know, let's say hibernate, they will create entities, they will make, will put proxies in front of them. And finally, you reach the end of the processing, you know, uh, cycle where you actually start those objects, you make them live, you know, start thread pools, um, open sockets, check the system time and stuff like that. So read secrets. So this is the truly dynamic stuff. And imagine every framework has to do something similar. So what if we reverse this logic and we try to do most of this work at build time? And that is the basic premise be behind Quarkus that also makes Quarkus unique if you compare it to an anything else. So in Quarkus, the idea is, what if we can enable those frameworks to do this in initialization when you build the application, not when you run it? Um, and of course, if you do that, you can uh, pretty much get rid of all these codes that is required to bootstrap the app and end up with this desired final state where your application can start executing. And this is what Corcus does. And this is how we manage to slim down the um, application in a significant uh, way that has an impact whether you run you know, your Quarkus app as a standard Java app, or you go further and you, you do a native uh, build. Oh, there's a question, but configuration differs between lab and live. Uh, yes, you can have different settings when you, as you develop and as you deploy. We'll talk more about it. Um, so the Quarkus build process looks pretty much like a standard build process. It's all Maven driven, but there is an extra step in the middle, the wiring and assemble step, where Quarkus performs its magic in order to produce the Java code. 
And I, you can see you picture there how the Quark's architecture looks internally. So there's a lot of stuff in the core. And for every participating framework, we have the corresponding extension that has intimate knowledge of that particular framework. So for example, again, Hibernate, Hibernate extension. And the extension knows how to drive the framework to perform the build type initialization. It's quite interesting how this happens. I can let you know, you know very quickly that the way we do it is the extension will drive, will essentially try to create this runtime, let's say image of, of the application. And Quarkus uses what we call a recorder technology. Well, we we proxy those calls and we see what the extension will create. And then we write to the resulting Java application, the bytecode that performs the exact same steps to create the final state, right? After all the processing is done, the parsing, etc. Quarkus knows that, you know, when the application starts, I will execute this bytecode sequence that will create those 10 objects and wire them together and then start them, which is great. It's like as if you, I give you the solution to the problem, you don't have to do all the reading. <laughs> and there's another magic, let's say, thing that happens that uh, when you start from this very optimized Java representation, then any sort of uh, ahead of time compilation you do to produce a native image, it's also very much optimized because you start from an optimized view. Uh, a few words about Graal. Graal is a whole ecosystem, a whole world. Uh, the things that are interesting to Quarkus is really the Graal compiler and the substrate VM. So the Graal compiler is a JIT compiler that can work on a normal you know, hotspot, but can also compile um, offline the application into native code. This can work if the application follows certain constraints. So not all applications can be compiled. That's the trick that makes, that's what makes Graal, let's say difficult to use for the average user. And Substrate VM is a, let's say the scaled down virtual machine written in this, um, subset of Java that's convenient for the Graal compiler to compile. And then you, when you combine Substrate VM, the JDK classes themselves, your application code and all the frameworks you use and you feed it into the Graal compiler, you can combine all those objects to produce a native executable where you know JVM and code is it's one thing. There's no JVM anymore, there is a native application. Um, what's interesting is uh, the Graal can do a lot of optimization, what we call closed world assumption, where it can track all call paths and eliminate all the code that is not used. And that reduces even more the, the executable. Um, now the dark side of uh, AOT compilation is that you cannot do everything, those are the constraints I told you. So there's no dynamic class loading, obviously. Uh, and some other things like reflection, dynamic proxies, JNI, things that are quite common in Java. Uh, uh, they need special configuration to work. And this special configuration can be quite complicated when you have complex frameworks. But the good thing with Quarkus is it makes those things totally transparent. As long as you have extensions for the frameworks you want to use, or you can provide those extensions yourself, then anything you do in Java automatically compiles into native using a simple flag. And I'll show you how, how to do that. Now, why do that? Well, there are very good uh, performance reasons to start with. So you take a, let's say standard uh, microservice, you will normally use using, right, using Spring Boot in most cases, and you, let's say you quarkify it, you move it over to Quarkus. Then memory consumption will fall to like half the, the memory space. Then boot speed will 
most likely increase you know by five times or be reduced by by five times so uh, and if you go the extra step and compile to native memory size falls even more to about the fifth of the original size and boot time becomes maybe 50 times faster so those are significant savings where if you consider a cloud deployment translates you know directly to to money you need less space to run the equivalent um, processing type of processing. Um, now every, but uh, you know, every uh, usage, like every mode has their own usages. So you can stick with Java, you know, totally stick with Java and use Quarkus um, and you get this nice optimized image. Um, the JVM is still the environment that will offer you the best raw performance due to all the JIT compilation and optimizations and you know years of experience there in um, JVM design. Um, all the known monitoring tools, so uh, that works fine, you know. And many people just stick with that. Uh, but you can do also the extra step and compile to, to native. Uh, with native, you can get a bit less raw performance, but then because the sizes are smaller, you can deploy more instances. So in the same space, you can overall, you know, get more, uh, let's say CPU processing. And of course, boot times with native are insane, you know, a few tenths of uh, milliseconds. Uh, and you can do both. You can deploy them side by side, uh, you know, Java and native. You can develop on Java and then deploy on native. You have pretty much all options. Um, let's see if I can do a quick uh, demo for you. And I hope those are big enough for you to show, to see. Uh, now, when you want to start with Quarkus, you go to the Quarkus website. Um, you can go to code Quarkus IO, which is the, you know, the initializer where you can just, uh, you know, browse the available extensions you can choose you know some of them and then generate an application and from there you can see there's you know there's lots of stuff we have something like 330 extensions at this point and the list keeps growing i can show you for example you can filter you can see we have we provide some spring support we, we implement some spring apis on top of quarkus if you you know want to make this type of migration um, but I think I, you know, I will, I will do it old school. So I will just start a command line uh, Quarkus application. And since Quarkus is very much Maven driven, it's all you know using the Quarkus Maven plugin. So let's make an app, a small microservice, and create a sample resource. If this is big enough, you know, shout microservice Maven packets. So straight away you can build it. And this should produce a small sample uh, Quarkus app with a REST API um, that you can just execute Java jar target and this is it. There's no Docker involved. This is, you know, straight Java, you know, completely no magic. And you can see Star Quarkus, Quarkus started in 0 0.8 uh, seconds. If, if I do it again, probably it will be a bit faster. Yeah. And I can check Quarkus is running. I can go to localhost and you see something like this. So Quarkus is running, you know, simple. Uh, let me start an IDE somewhere there. Okay. And the way you can work with Quarkus is uh, is you can start the de what do we call the dev mode. So let's say maybe compile oop, compile Quarkus dev. 
So what, what it does is it starts Quarkus in a special mode in the background. So Quarkus should be there. So I could, you know, yeah, it's there, it's listening. And then I should be able to go back to my ID. Did, sorry, somehow the ID doesn't operate. Uh, maybe I had another image running already. Yeah, okay. Import later. Yes. Okay, let it import the project. So it solves from scratch, basically, that's why. You saw this message. I'm starting it again. Yeah, it should be okay now, I think. And then when you go to the ID, you see there is this sample resource already created. So naturally this should be running if I go there and say, you know, hello. You see Quarkus is there, right? Uh, so the, you know, the way to work with Quarkus is, you know, you go there, start making changes. So hello, JCon, save, go back, refresh. And you immediately see the change, which is, you know, makes you feel weird. Let's say do it again, save, go back, refresh, and it's there. So this is compiled Java code. It's not interpreted. And how this is done, if you, if you go there, back to the command line, you see, you see Quarkus does the following, basically. I hit with the browser the endpoint, and then Quarkus freezes, checks the file system, looks to see if there's any change. Yes, hello, resource, Java was changed. So it will recompile it, stop the server, start the server, and let the request uh, continue. And this all happened in 0 0.2, 25, uh, you know, a quarter of a second. So in a quarter of a second, all this happened, you know, without even noticing. So in most cases, you won't even notice that Quarkus is reloading. And then you can, you know, start, continue coding. Let's you know, do some simple stuff. Let's, you know, put that in a configuration property. Let's say greeting and put a default value. Hello Quarkus. Message like this. Yeah, let's take it out and return the message. So maybe this works. Let's see. Yeah, hello Quarkus. So I just wanted to show you how you configure Quarkus. You use configuration properties and then you can put it in this single configuration file. So if I configure the, the greeting, hello Quarkus. Hello, JCon, and save again. Yeah, it should, shoots back to JCon. Ah, oh, there's somewhere there, there's even a test. I will be a good citizen, fix the test. Yes. <laughs> right, now, so you continue with your coding, and then let's say you want to start adding extensions. So you open the POM. If you, go, if you see the POM, um, Let's, you see, I'm using the REST as the extension. This basically allows me to implement, you know, REST. So, oop, yeah. So let's say, come on. I want to have more of that. I'll add a few extension there. The ID knows about Quarkus if I start typing, let's say, metrics, I'll get micro profile metrics. If I type health, health checks, and I'll let's throw a bit of uh, spring just for fun. Save, uh, synchronize, uh, yeah, okay. And then if I go back to my code, I should be able to use this new facility. So to create a simple, let's say, metric. I think you can use it, count it annotation from microprofile. So name was, let's say this is the hellos. 
and description goes. Let's see if this works. So save, go back. So do I have metrics in my application? Localhost. Yeah, so I've just added an application metric. Every time I hit the endpoint, hello, hello, this counter should go up. So yeah, I hit hello four times. And there's all sorts of metrics there. You see, you get by default, you know, shoot lot of metrics. Um, um, yeah, and I, I didn't leave the ID if you noticed. So Quarkus just loaded the necessary extension uh, dynamically. Um, yeah, and I think I would, yeah, I would write you a simple spring uh, endpoint, but I think I'm, I mean, I'm a bit behind on time, so I will, I will skip that. But you know, you can write Spring APIs. You can do Spring controllers inside Quarkus, and it will work. Uh, what I want to show you here is, let's say you build your application, and you want to compile to native. So basically, the only thing you have to do is do, say, yeah, choose a native profile. So if that works properly. Yeah, if you will even run my test. <laughs> yeah, it will compile to native. Now you see those huge command lines and everything. We, this is all on us to make this run smoothly. So I go back to the slides um, to say a few things more. So, you know, I, I, I hope that gave you a very quick, um, you know, idea of what is Quarkus. Now, what are the Quarkus benefits? Uh, prime, first of all, it's performance. Um, you take an application, it's the gray color, you Quarkify it, you get the blue color, like you know, half of the size. You make it native, it goes even smaller. And the same happens to the boot times. So you saw, you know, Quarkus booting in you know 0.8 seconds for an application that has uh, REST, uh, metrics, health check, and also uh, Spring web support. And, and you'll see the native uh, times when, when the build is over. Um, developer joy, this very nice mode where you work in your ID, you run Quarkus in the background and it keeps reloading uh, very fast. You don't even notice. Um, Quarkus uses reasonable default, so most things work without any configuration. Uh, configuration is concentrated in one file, most, most nor normally. And for most cases, you know, uh, things work out of the box. Um, then something we didn't talk about at all is Quarkus is based, is built on a reactive core. So at the core, we have Vertex, which is a very established project in the reactive space for, for years now. Um, and this allows Quarkus to present either uh, imperative or reactive APIs on pretty much anything we do. Uh, we also have some new APIs in the reactive space, uh, something called Mutiny. Uh, to make writing reactive application easy. Uh, so you have you know, both options available. And then this thing that we say that Quarkus is essentially a framework of frameworks. We don't, we don't reinvent the wheel when it comes to the frameworks themselves. We will choose whatever makes sense, whether it comes from the standard space, whether it comes, whether, whether it's a de facto standards, we will try to to support it. Of course, it depends on the community as well to provide extensions for things that, you know, they like. Um, so Quarkus in this sense will sound very familiar. Let's say if you come from the Java space, you know, it, it will look very familiar. Uh, we have micro profile. Uh, we implement some Spring APIs, about eight of them. So you can use that as well. 
Um, and we also innovate on top of that. So we've added, now that we explore the abilities of build time optimization, we have uh, things like uh, uh, Panache for data access, uh, Qt templating engine, uh, Fungi uh, to write functions. Um, I'm probably missing something. Yeah. So yeah, mutiny. So new things are are, are coming as as we speak. Now release cadence. Um, for the first year of the of the project, we were very aggressive. On average, we were releasing Quarkus every nine days. Um, now we have settled to a community release every month. So March, April, June, you get a new feature release. And in the meantime, you might get you know, a, a point to release with some fixes. So we release 1.5, there was a bug, we fixed it in 1.5.1, then 1.5.2, then we went to 1.6. So things are moving quite fast. On the product side, we also started supporting Quarkus officially as a Red Hat product. We call this the, the Red Hat build of Quarkus. So every six months we fork the community project. So around April, we forked Quarkus 1.3. In that particular stream, we patch and support for six months. In October, like this month, we fork you know, Quarkus 1.7 and we will support for another six months. So this is a slower moving stream if you don't want to update uh, that often. And on the product side, we also um, have something we call the, the Mandrel project. Um, Mandrel is a, it's a packaging of GraalVM. It's hosted on, on the GraalVM GitHub, uh, where we replace the uh, GraalVM internally uses uh, Oracle Labs JDK. So for support reasons, we replace that with standard Open JDK. So, so can, we can feel confident that we can support it as part of a Red Hat offering. Um, and this is a subset of Graal. We don't include uh, the non-native uh, uh, bits. We only include the things that are required to do a native build. Um, a few things quickly about Quarkiverse. So again, I said Quarkus has about 330 extensions as of now, and more are coming. Uh, we used to put everything in the Quarkus, let's say, core uh, GitHub repository, but this is not scalable. scalable. Uh, people you could host their own Quarkus extensions, but then it's the problem of how we can point to them and test them. So we created this new organization called Quarkus Universe, Quarkiverse, where people can add their own extension you know, and use all the facilities we provide for building, publishing, testing, and automatic inclusion in the extensions registry. So all the Quarkus tooling is aware about your extension. It's a great place to collaborate. Um, now roadmap, um, do I have time for that? <laughs> Basically, you can click on that link and you can see there's a Kanban board that shows what the team is working on. Um, there are quite, quite many Quarkus contributors. Um, last count, I think we probably had maybe 100 Red Hat people and 100 not Red Hat people. It could be more, I think, um, that contributed to Quarkus. Um, Generally speaking, you'll see some work on CLI. We're creating a CLI for Quarkus. Uh, lots of performance optimizations. So the good thing with Quarkus is as the extension themselves mature and can do more complex optimizations, your applications automatically receive those benefits by just rebuilding using the latest. Uh, we will improve Kotlin support. We do a lot of work in reactive and more extensions uh, on the way. I had to put that slide there because I always forget what happened to the native build. So, all right, I have to go back there. All right, so it took one and a half minute on my machine. So the more, the more memory you can give it, the, the, the faster it goes. So the native build is completed. Uh, and if I look at the target directory, 
those are the files and you can see that this is this is a mac native executable so if i go and execute it targets you can see so this thing started in 16 milliseconds right it's quite impressive considering that includes support for CDI, RESTZ, Jackson, Health, Checks, Metrics, Spring BI and Spring Web and, and all those things should work. So I should have my endpoint is there, Metrics is there, yeah, welcome screen is there and so on. So, so I want to learn more. You can go to Quarkus.io, you know, we'll, we have a very active community. We welcome contributions. Um, and I think I'm just on time to, you know, start uh, taking questions. The native build, uh, the native build is just a, a normal executable. I, I saw it here. Yes, it's a native executable. And you can also use a build using a, you know, a Docker container. So in, in that container, we can, let's say, cross compile to produce a, a Linux executable. Uh, how do you see Project Luma effective reactive features? This is very interesting. Uh, Project Loom is very promising. It, it could mean that we have to rethink uh, how we do reactive. Um, of course, there are certain reactive APIs that are very well, you know, designed and people can can have full control over what they're doing so so i don't expect those to go away uh, and also project loom is you know a few years out so so for now you know we have to live with what we have in, in terms of the technology available so so i I'm, i guess they're gonna coexist uh, native command works only with graal vm um, you mean the native builds? Uh, yes, uh, Graal VM or this other project that I told you, the, the Mandrel distribution of Graal VM. So it's Graal VM again, but with OpenJDK inside, yes. So, uh, Thomas, which web server we're using? Uh, yes, yeah, so in, we're using uh, Undertow. Anderto is a project that came from the Jbos application server. So it's the same project. It's a, it's a very fast web server. It's one of the fastest uh, out there. All right. Uh, would it be possible to migrate existing applications using reflection and other runtime things to Quarkus? Um, if you stick to Java, you can use any library you want. It's simple. You know, any library will work. It won't be optimized like for the things we provide extension, but it will work. Also, if this library uses reflection and stuff like that, you have to manually configure it to make it compile to native if you want to compile to native. So, so yes, you can use any library you want, but you won't get the full benefits of native compilation. And the promise of Quarkus is that for something for which we have an extension, it should automatically compile to native. If it doesn't, it's a bug and you know you can open a ticket so we can sort it out. How many people are working in the technical Quarkus area? Uh, it's interesting um, because um, Quarkus was a special project for Red Hat. Normally in the past you have a, you know, a team let's say the application server team starting a project and doing something. But with Quarkus, things started differently. We collected experts from different projects. So Hibernate, performance, security, persistence, uh, runtime design. And we put it together and we created a virtual team. So even in Red Hat, the, let's say the, the who participates with Quarkus can be complicated, but generally speaking, there are maybe 50 people involved with Quarkus, you know, regularly. 
uh, and then other people coming and going from the project. Um, and of course, we use a lot of stuff that I, I, I won't count as Quarku. So uh, let's say if I use uh, the, you know, the key clock libraries, this is a separate team. We just use what they produce. What are the intentions of Red Hat for the Quarkus area in the future growing? Um, I th I Red Hat is very committed to, to Quarkus. Uh, we see this as honestly, the, it's the future of, of cloud native Java. Um, and we, you know, we'd love to see it uh, growing and succeeding in depends on the community also. Um, the signals we have are are very positive. We we see people uh, migrating to Quarkus and you know seeing real real benefits. Um, maybe I should put some links there. Um, we have our website. You can hear about user stories. You know people that did the migration. Uh, if you have uh, you know normal experience with Java IE of or Spring Boot, it should be relatively easy. People were able to migrate in you know in a matter of uh, weeks, basically, and rewrite pieces of their applications and and reap the benefits because you know you can see immediately the you know the improvement in speed or even code reduction. Uh, we're discussing with some people, you know, the, the equivalent stuff written in Spring Boot. You do it with Microvore file or Quarkus, and you you see a thirty percent reduction in the amount of code to do this, the same thing. So, uh, will Wildfly be continue to be developed, um, and Quarkus will exist on alternative projects? Uh, yes, uh, Wildfly is not going anywhere. Um, uh, application servers will exist, you know, uh, until the sun melts, I think. Um, and if you look at Wellfly, it's still evolving. Um, every six months you get a new release. It's been modernized. So Wellfly now includes support for micro profile. And it has technology, something called the Galleon that lets you choose, uh, let's say pieces of the server to create a custom distribution, which is slimmed down. It has all the interesting integrations with uh, Kubernetes. Um, so it's still evolving and, and it's going well. So it's really up to the user to decide, you know, have, a, have an application. Um, do I, let's say, cloudify it? I can do a simple lift and shift. You know, I take it, I put it in the cloud and it works. Uh, because the thing is, as soon as you miniaturize and do microservices, you have to bear the cost of handling all the environment around it. And it can be complex. I mean, writing the Microsoft is simple, but do all the, you know, logging, distributed tracing, setting up, and, you know, it, it's complex. So, so it's not for everyone. I, you can still write, you know, monoliths uh, for many problems and it will work great. So uh, now about the standards, um, they're moving fin finally after some time. Um, it's to be seen what will happen with Jakarta E. Uh, Wildfly will implement whatever is there. Quarkus is more flexible in the sense we can pick and choose the things that we think make sense. And this simplifies things a lot. You can move a lot, a lot faster like this. Um, so yeah, both options will will coexist yeah thanks uh, for staying uh, that time in europe it's almost eight o'clock 